to uh, to be back this year. You know, it's it's kind of interesting. Um, you think about it. I mean, some of us here have been using Rails for like 45 years, even maybe. It seems like forever. I mean, uh, and, and then on the other hand, it seems like how does that much time gone by? It, it, it's flown by in some other some ways. So I think it's interesting to think back. Last year when I came here. Um, I just sort of asked for a show of hands from people who who was doing Rails or who was trying to transition from Rails to go from sort of dabbling in it to going full time. So this year I thought it'd kind of be interesting. Um, obviously, some of you might not have been here last year, but but who's doing Rails full time as their full time job right now? Who's doing it as sort of a hobby or a part time? Thing. See, the, those numbers were almost reversed even just a year ago, and I, I think that's pretty interesting. Most of the people here raised their hands when I asked who was doing it full time. I, I think that's pretty cool. I think we've come a long way even in, in just a year. Um, when I was talking to Rob about uh, speaking here today, uh, I said, what's the sort of the overall emphasis, or what's, what's the kind of the, the, the main message that you're trying to get across? And he said, you know, it's about being more productive and more efficient with, with Rails. Doing your job and delivering work for your customers and your clients and, and at work using Rails. And how do you become more effective? So I started to think, well, if I'm going to keynote this thing, especially if it's at the end of the day, these people have had two really majorly intensive days of talking. And, you know, how do you, how do you put a kind of a... a a point on that. Well, obviously, you know, you, you want to talk about being more efficient, you want to talk about being more productive, but at the same time, I think we kind of get caught up in, in that. Uh, so I, I almost wanted to, to end on a note that hopefully will make you think a little bit more about the whole aspect of, of what it means to be productive and where that kind of efficiency and productivity comes from. Does it come from the tools that we use? Or does it come from the way that we think and the way that, that, that we work and the things that, that we build inside our, own, uh, inside our own head? So anyway, the, the talk is uh, sort of informally titled Distraction, Attention, and Simplicity. And those are some of the things that I plan to, to try to talk to uh, tonight. So we'll see how it goes. Um, Let's, let's start out by, by saying something that uh, I think a lot of us maybe know unconsciously. We're, we're all victims and we're all distracted. You guys are distracted and we're all distracted. Um, most of you, it seems, uh, have your laptops on and a lot of you are looking at the screen. Sometimes you look up, sometimes you, you stay looking down. I've been to conferences, I, I do the same thing sometimes. Um, Within that world of your computer, you know, you've got SMS, you've got Twitter alerts, you might be in campfire, you know, you might be in IRC, you're seeing the little growl alerts pop up when somebody commits code to your project. I mean, all of these things are happening and it sort of becomes this big stream of multitasking that you're engaged in for eight, ten hours a day. And even here at this conference where I'm up here talking to you guys, a lot of you are looking at your screens. Like I said, I don't expect you to look up and I, I know better, I'm a geek, I, I'm not offended by it. But at the same time, there's a part of your brain that you're hearing what I'm saying, but it's, it's different from actually listening. It's different from being engaged. And if, if you and I were at lunch right now, you probably wouldn't be looking at your computer, but in this setting, it's okay to do that. Um, but how would you feel if, obviously, there's always an internet connection issue whenever you're one of these things, but how would you feel if that computer, you didn't have the choice to look at it, if it was taken away, you'd feel you'd re be resentful. I was talking to somebody earlier today and they were saying the longest 30 or 40 minutes of their life uh, is the time from when you get on the airplane until the time when you're at the cruising altitude and you can, you can uh, bring out your laptop or your noise canceling headphones or whatever it is. I've been there too, I think these are normal things, but in, in your day to day life, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see how those distractions actually come into play. I'm not gonna try and say, well, you know, you spend three hours a day on Twitter and I am, and that takes away from your productivity. I'm not talking about that. Um, 
but you know, it, 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 it's interesting to think about the way that these distractions actually affect you and, and affect you at a, at a very subtle level. Um, this is a, you know, I'm going to be showing some, sharing some quotes. This is just one of my own quotes. Um, the most successful objects, devices, and applications have simple and obvious functionality. So I, I have some props today. I'm not really a prop guy. Um, this is a Polaroid camera, a, a real old-fashioned Polaroid. And there are eight pictures left. Um, this little flashing light, if you can see it, tells me that uh, the thing is warming up. Now it's warmed up. When I say that there are eight pictures left, that actually means something because uh, they don't make these Polaroid cartridges anymore. <laughs> so uh, say cheese. Seven. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's see how that comes out. It, it, it takes a little while. But th there's, some, there's some cool things. I mean, th this, this is a Polaroid camera. It's called a 1-600, 100 millimeter focus range. Um, I got this camera when I, after uh, Dan Cederholm and I built Corked, there was a magazine called Imbibe that wanted to do a feature on us. And they had this, this idea where they would send these Polaroid cameras out and you were supposed to take a picture of yourself or have someone take it of you and you'd send the picture in and they would have these little Polaroids. And I probably should have had a picture of what the, the ad thing came out, but um, you know, we took these pictures and we sent them in, but they said, well, you could just keep the camera. Um, I think there were probably, you know, maybe 20 pictures on the camera. I don't, I don't even know how many, and I, we took a few. And, and I, I found this sitting in my closet not that long ago, and I thought, you know, it's so interesting because I've got a, I've got a really nice digital SLR camera that's big and bulky, and, you know, then I also carry around my iPhone. And I take most of my pictures when I'm running around with the iPhone. The idea that, that and there's a strap on this, like... <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're going to walk around with this thing and take pictures with this thing. Like, that doesn't seem like something any of us would do anymore. If I'm carrying something this big, it better be a digital SLR camera with, you know, a 7200 lens on it or something. Um, but, but what's interesting about that, even though it's sort of antiquated, it has this sort of simple, obvious functionality on the, on the back. I don't know if you can see it. There's just a simple little button. There's one button to, to, to take the picture. And there's a little light that lets you know when it's ready. And that's it. And for decades, that was the only way that you could get an immediate picture. That was the only way you could get that immediate result. And most of us are in this kind of world of wanting immediate results. I mean, if you look at something, I think a big part of the success of Twitter, and people in here who, who might follow me on Twitter know, it, 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 it's fun. I like, to, I like to use Twitter just like everybody else. And part of the thing I think I like about it is that it gives you immediate results. You get that instant, I don't know if the right word is satisfaction, but you get that instant sense that you've said something. You know, I, I, I write a lot of blog posts, and sometimes it can take 20 minutes to write one, five minutes, but usually it, it takes some time. Um, you, can, you can have that conversation, that sense of immediacy on, on a social network or something like Twitter with, without having to spend too much time doing it. You get those results instantly. And that actually has a negative side effect, because you start to want to get that result or get that effect um, in the rest of your life too. And I think it's, it's there could be a negative to that in, in the way that it affects the way that we think and the way that we eventually try to solve problems. Um, still talking about this, this philosophy that I have, um, and you know I'm gonna talk about Apple eventually, but um, my grandfather was a metallurgist uh, and he worked for the US government for many years. And this was his slide rule. Um, I'm not going to pass this around or anything, because it's sort of fragile now. Um, but you, I'm not really sure how to use a slide rule, but this, this thing slides out. And I mean, the people that can use them, the people that know how to use them, um, they can do amazing things that we would do on a calculator uh, or on our phones. Uh, they can do them just as fast, just as efficiently with something like this. Um, the interesting thing to point out 
is that um, this was made in December 22nd, 08, 1908. And this thing is still around. This thing is still working just as well and just as elegantly as it ever did. The fact that I don't know how to use it aside, this is the kind of thing that was built to last. And there are so few things now that are, that are still built to last in the same way. Um, now here's something else that I brought. Like I said, I'm not really a prop guy, so. Um, what is this, anyone? Okay, what's, what's something you can do with this? Okay. I was expecting some smart aleck answers, but yes, it, it is a can opener. I, I, I don't know how long I've had this particular can opener, probably five or so years, maybe longer. We go with the manual can openers at, at my house because the electrical ones inevitably have some kind of a problem or the lid gets stuck and they get gross and they're hard to clean. This is a pretty simple device and they haven't really changed very much in, I don't know, the last hundred years. They're, they're simple, they're easy to use, and if you, you know, if you spend you know, a few dollars, you can get something that we take for granted. I mean, the whole sort of knowledge that it takes to make things that go into cans, the kinds of technology that's involved in distributing them and getting them out, those are all things that we take for granted. Our interface with that can is the can opener. And that's all we ever think about. How do we get the stuff out of the can? You just crank the thing, it pops in, that's it. What, what I think we should think about when we build things, obviously we're, most of us are building software. We're not building traditional tools. We're not building something that you can physically touch and hold in your hand. But there's no reason why we can't build things that last, build things that are simple and that are elegant. I can't really think of a, of a better way to open up a can than this. You know, it's powered, you do it yourself. Yeah, maybe you could make it smaller, lighter, stronger, but it's the same, it's the same design. I think what, what we need to think about when we're building something is that how can, we, how can we go the opposite direction? How can we reduce the number of features? How can we reduce what it does and focus more on building something that can last? Um, this is another quote. This is my own quote. We'll get to some other people's quotes soon. Um, but if you have to explain how something you've built, in this case software, if you have to explain how it works, then in my opinion, then it's failed. Things should be more intuitive than that. Now it's fine to explain a concept. It's fine to, but, but if you have to sit down and really tell somebody this is how you use it, then a big component of the usability uh, is, is gone. So this is the Flip Ultra. Um, a lot of people probably have Flip Ultras. I have an Ultra and I have the, the even smaller HD one. But to me, this is, this is a modern day can opener. It does one thing, it takes videos. And I don't have a picture of the back of it, but on the back of it, there's a big red button and a screen. You can hand this thing to probably anybody at three years or older, all the way up to 100 years old, and say, you can take video with this. They, they get how it works. If they've ever seen a camera, if they've ever been exposed even a little bit to Western culture, they're gonna know what a camera is, you point it, you press the big red button. And that's it, and that's all the flip does. Now some people criticize it, it you know, oh, my camera can do that, sure. But these things sell like crazy, and it's because they're so simple to use and so easy to use. You know, I have a 14 month old son, and it was something that I can hand him. Now he doesn't know how to use it, but I'm, I'm okay handing it to him. I'm okay if he runs around with it, and maybe even you know, drops it on the ground, because it's something that I know it's gonna, it's gonna withstand that. But it's a, it's a really elegant, sim simple, simply designed piece of equipment. Um, one of the things that it does really well is it, the, the functionality, and that you can do a little bit more. You can delete, uh, you can watch the video on it. But I think that, that devices that, that are successful, they embed more complicated functionality and they shield users who aren't interested in it from actually using it. So this is my last prop for the day. This is my uh, Metal Zone MT2 guitar pedal. 
Um, I've had this pedal for, I would say, probably about 15 or 20 years, somewhere in, in that time period. This will give you kind of a, a real sort of chunky Metallica-esque distortion sound. And if you really fine tune it, you can, you can kind of get into a classic rock pseudo Hendrixy kind of a sound from it. The reason that I brought this is this, this is a good example of an object that I think does a really good job of giving you basic functionality that has embedded more complicated or refined functionality. If you just want to plug your guitar into this thing, you can stomp on it and it'll give you good distortion. And you can control the distortion and the volume by turning this knob. And that's it. You need one knob. If you want to refine it, maybe you want a little, you know, old school Black Sabbath, you can do that by turning these knobs. And these knobs actually have two rings around them. And this thing I will pass around if you guys are interested. You can fine tune it by turning these little knobs. And if you don't do that, you still get a pretty cool sound. And it's, it's good in and of itself. But if you take the time to actually turn those knobs, you're going to get, and I don't have a guitar to hand around with it so you can experiment. But I like devices like this because they embed that more complicated sense of, of the technology. They, they don't require you to spend too much time mastering something. That's a simple device, but, but you get the idea. Um, the dials give you more functionality. This was the first pedal I ever saw to do that. In the past, I'd had to have two pedals or three pedals to, to get the kind of sounds out of it that you can get with that one. Um, so here's a quote from, uh, from our friend Steve Jobs. And uh, I, I, will, I will read this. Uh, innovation comes from saying no to 1,000 things to make sure we don't get on the wrong track or try to do too much. We're always thinking about new markets we could enter, but it's only by saying no that you can concentrate on the things that are really important. And so often, as a software developer myself and, and when I work with other people who are building software or creating products even outside of the software space, thinking back to that flip, thinking back to that can opener, they're always adding functionality. A lot of the time, it's, it's saying no. It's deciding what you don't want to build. So when you're starting to build something, Start by focusing on what you will not build. Just say no. When you're sitting down to create something, if, if you think, oh, we can do these 50 things. We have to do these 50 things because our competitors do these 50 things. We need to do those and we need to do 10 more than they do. Because otherwise we won't com we'll never compete. That's, that's not true. You will compete. If you do even 10 things, but you do those 10 things so well and so elegantly that it doesn't matter that they do 50 things because the 10 things that you do so well, so what if those, if those other cameras, the pocket camera that you already have can do video? That doesn't matter. You're still going to buy a flip. Why? Because it does that one thing and does it so well. Another thing, and most of you in here know this, is that features are addictive. Once you start doing one, yeah, well, you know, we could make it do this, we could make it do that, we could add this, uh, this function, we could add that function, and, you, and eventually, what it, it, some people would call this scope creep, but it's actually worse than that. It's addictive, especially in this community, because there are so many gems and plugins and cool things that people are building and putting out on GitHub and forking that it's like you can't build a simple application anymore. If you don't have OAuth in your app, well, forget, I don't even want to look at it. Well, I actually think that's a good idea. Maybe it's a bad example, but th there is now the prerequisite is like, of course, everything has to support X, Y, and Z. You have to have a million features or nobody's even gonna, gonna pay attention. It's become quantity over quality. And what happened to quality? Um, I don't know if anybody here has read uh, a book called Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persick. Uh, great book, which talks about quality, um, the concept of quality, the deeper sense of, of quality uh, in just the way that we think. There's a really interesting uh, chapter in that book. The, the book is more or less, it's, it's, it's if you've ever heard the term Chautauqua, it's, it's almost like a spiritual journey of one man with his son riding a motorcycle. I think it takes place in the 60s. They're driving across the country. The other details aren't important for, for right now. Um, but the, the author, the narrator, 
is telling a story about how his friend, at one point he and his friend were riding their motorcycles. And his friend's motorcycle, if I remember the story right, it's been probably 15 years since I read it, um, his friend's motorcycle had a problem, and I think it was a BMW, the motorcycle. And whatever the problem was, it could be fixed by getting a small piece of aluminum, kind of curved, kind of cylindrical, and putting that over whatever it was, whether it was a gasket or a tube or something. Well, it turns out that the perfect way to fix this thing, they're broken down, they're on the side of the road, they're gonna have to stay at a cheap motel if they don't pick up their time. The way to fix this is to take a tin can, aluminum can, and use that, that'll, that'll fix it at least until you get to a place where you can get the bike fixed proper. The guy wouldn't have anything to do with it. He said, no, this is a BMW, I'm not putting a cast aside beer can off the side of the road, I'm not using that to fix my, my nice bike. You know, the quality gets in the way. But it's interesting to think about how we view quality when, it, when our lives are so filled with trying to add features, trying to be competitive, trying to produce, trying to be so effective. Um, those things can actually get in the way. You know, I talked about the, the can opener and building something to last. Even though we think, well, we're, you know what, I'll just come back to this in a month or on the next sprint and I'll fix that or I'll add those features. There are so very few things that are built today to last the way that my grandfather's slide rule was built to last. Um, I was talking to my friend John Gruber uh, just the other day and, and he said, we were talking about iPhone apps. And he said that he almost thinks that iPhone apps are a lot, are more like albums, more like songs, than they are like traditional applications that you develop. Um, I think it's interesting because he's right. You build this iPhone app, and once it's done, you know, you may do a bug fix, but you're not going to, like, continue to really refine and build it. You move on to the next one. Oh, I did that app, now I'm building the next app. And I think we have, we can be guilty of that too. I think a lot of the time we're, we're so interested in building that next thing that we're not focusing enough time on the refinement and the quality. I mean, things like the slide roller, that can opener, those things, people spend years to create those things. And I think the difference is, is in that I still have this slide rule 100 years later. I still have this can opener 10 years later. Um, those things are meant to last because they're physical. But when we're building applications, we know in the back of our mind, well, this thing isn't going to be, you know, version two is going to be out and version three is going to be out. So it's easier for us to dismiss and disassociate ourselves from that and be distracted by the request for features. Um, this is a, I, I don't remember where I heard this. I think I heard it from a friend of mine, but it's been so long that I, I it's just something I think about all the time. Um, a poor man can afford only the very best. Well, what does that mean? If you go out and you go to Home Depot and you need to buy a shovel, there's a shovel for $15 and there's a shovel for $30. Most of us, especially if it's our first house, we're going to buy the $15 shovel. And this is the one with, you know, maybe the wooden handle and the two screws that hold the head of the shovel on. And after you use it for a while, those screws will eventually become loose. So you can tighten them up and spend a little time doing that. And eventually the threads will wear out and the screws won't work anymore. So then you can go buy bigger screws or you can get some kind of a, you know, epoxy glue or something. I've tried this. And inevitably the, the head of the umbrella just, uh, umbrella, the head of the shovel won't, won't, won't stay on anymore. So you wind up having to go and then you say, well, I'm not buying a cheap shovel ever again. I'm buying a good shovel. Now you've spent $45. But if you had bought that nicer shovel to begin with, you would have saved $15. But that's not the mentality that a lot of us have. A lot of us say, well, we'll just get it out the door right now. We'll just build it right now. We'll just get this thing out there. And we'll make it good later. We'll fix it later. We'll, we'll make it work right later. And a lot of this, I know, comes from customers, comes from clients, comes from bosses who are saying, well, we need it Friday. Um, it's our responsibility to say no. It's our responsibility to be that person who communicates to them that we need to build something that we feel is quality. 
I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who, who, who like admit to me privately that their application sucks and that the code is a mess. Well, that, that's hard. That's you out there. You're putting yourself out there. If that's what you do all day, if you're spending eight hours a day building something and you're not proud of it, you know, what, what, what does that say? You've got to be proud of what you do. Um, you know, th th this, this goes back to another philosophy I have, which is to do as little as possible. What's the minimum amount that you need to do to have something that is successful, to make something that's great? What is the least that you need to do? What can you say no to? And it's not no in being negative and saying, oh, no, that's stupid. It's saying no as in no. Let, let's start more simply than that. Um, you know, I think anything, anytime that you come into a situation where you think that something has to be a certain way, it's your responsibility to say to yourself, what if the opposite was true? What if that thing that I take for granted or that I assume or that, that, I, that I believe to be true, what if the exact opposite were true? Now, maybe that, that won't make sense, but a lot of the time, that's enough to flip the way you're thinking upside down and, and let you see something from a different perspective, what they call in, in the school of Zen, which I don't, admittedly don't know a lot about, but uh, in the school of Zen, they, they call that beginner's mind. What if you could approach a problem as if you had never encountered it before, never solved it before, never heard about somebody solving it before? What if it was entirely new? A uh, device that was entirely new uh, was the iPod. And there were so many people who were saying the iPod won't sell, it's too expensive, there isn't enough storage space, it doesn't have an FM tuner. Uh, you know, the iPhone won't sell either. It doesn't have any GPS, it doesn't have a video camera, it's not 3G. Who wants that? You know, now they're projecting that there's going to be 45 million iPod, iPhones sold by the end of 2009. Now, that's a projection. That's not an actual number, but it looks like it's going to happen, even with the economy the way it is. Um, that's according to uh, the Piper Jeffrey analyst, uh, Gene Munster. I love that name. <laughs> um, function should define and insist on form. Again, we go back to the slide rule. We go back to the, to the camera. We go back to the can opener. What does it do? That can be your starting point to determine how it should work. What does it need to do? What does it need to accomplish? I still so often see, and, and it's weird to me because I've been building applications for, for so long now, and it, it still seems to be this way. It's almost like, well, we want it to look like this. We think it should work like this. Well, what does it need to do? What is what you're building? What does what you're building actually need to do? Let that determine how it does it. If that makes any sense. Um, you know, I think a lot these days about starting points. We spend a lot of time every day working on projects that have been hanging around, or we inherit somebody else's code, or we inherit a project from, oh, the, these other consultants came in and, and built this thing, and now they're gone, and now the CEO of the company is fr freaked out, and he's hired us, and we have to come in and, and fix it. You know, this is something that I think about, well, how do you find that starting point? There's something called Occam's Razor, which I'm sure everybody's heard of. You know, I, I don't know if that holds up for us a lot of the time. The simplest solution is always the best uh, solution. You know, I think the simplest solution isn't always the best answer, but it's a starting point. If you can simplify something down, no, that doesn't mean the simple thing is always right, but it's a great place to start. What's the bare minimum that you need to do? What's the absolute entry point? And start from there. Um, this will be more interesting, maybe. Uh, this is Bender. Uh, if any of you, how many here have seen Futurama? Okay, good. Uh, I love Futurama. It was a TV show that ran on the Fox Network from 1999 to 2003 and has subsequently come out with a couple of direct-to-DVD movies. Um, Bender is a, uh, you know, he drinks heavily, he smokes cigars, he's a kleptomaniacal, misanthropic kind of a guy. And um, in um, one episode, the episode is called Godfellas, in case you've seen it. Uh, he, for one reason or another, winds up going to sleep in a torpedo tube 
and gets launched into space from the Planet Express ship and is sort of floating in outer space for a while. And in the course of this, um, a small civilization of, of people, they're almost people, they're kind of like people, they're about that big, I think, maybe smaller. Uh, they sort of colonize his body and live on different parts of his body. And in doing so, um, they revere him as God. And inevitably, uh, as always happens with Bender and in shows like this, um, he, he treats them so badly that they, certain ones become atheists and attack the ones that believe in Bender, and they annihilate each other with, with nuclear weapons. So um, that's, that's just the background story for, for this next part. Um, in this clip that I'm about to show you, um, he's been floating in space for a time, and he, um, he encounters an entity which uh, offers him some advice. So tell me if it's, uh, if it's too loud. Hey, that galaxy signal in the binary. I got a signal back. But I only know the binary to ask where the bedroom is. You speak English? I do now. user-friendly, my good chum. Who built you? I have always been. Oh my god! Are you god? Possible. I do feel compassion for all living things, my good chum. But why would God think of binary? Unless you're not god, but the remains of a computerized space probe that collided with god. That seems probable. So, do you know what I'm gonna do before I do it? Yes. What if I do something different? Then I don't know that. Oh. <laughs> a lot of people pray to you, huh? Yes, but there are so many asking so much. After a while, you just sort of tune it out. You know, I was God once. Yes, I saw. You were doing well until everyone died. It was good. I tried helping them. I tried not helping them. But in the end, I couldn't do them any good. Do you think what I did was wrong? Right and wrong are just words. What matters is what you do. Yeah, I know. That's why I asked if what I did... Now forget. Bender, being God isn't easy. If you do too much, people get dependent on you. And if you do nothing, they lose hope. You have to use a light touch, like a safe cracker or a pickpocket. Or a guy who burns down a bar for the insurance money. Yes, if you make it look like an electrical thing. When you do things right, people won't be sure you've done anything at all. Okay. So the, the quote there at the end that God says to Bender is, uh, if you do things right, no one will be sure you've done anything at all. Um, I love that quote. Doesn't, doesn't God sound a bit like an overworked developer there talking about all of his, uh, his tickets that he's got? Um, what, what's actually interesting about that is the philosophy, and I've referenced that quote in, in another talk that I gave, but I really wanted to show the whole clip, not only because it's funny, but because as developers, as designers, as people who are creating things that other people use, we have a lot of responsibility. Maybe not quite that much responsibility, but we have a lot. We're going to define how users interact with the software that we build. We're defining their user experience. Even if you have a user experience person on your team, even if you have a designer on your team, and even if your boss or your customer or your client is telling you, well, it's got to work like this because that's what we want it to work like, you still have a responsibility, I think, to, to do things right. And as a developer, one of my personal goals is to be invisible, to get out of the way. If something works well, you don't need to explain how it works. You don't need to think how it works. You've got a simple Polaroid camera. You've got a flip camera. You've got a can opener. These are things that they just work. And if you can get out of the way, you can get your technology out of the way, you can get the complexity out of the way like we did with that guitar pedal, then you're in a situation where you're providing that simple interface. You're not overburdening the users. Before you start something, stop. 
you know, we talked before about how you want everything right away. Everybody is telling you, hurry, launch, just, do, I used to say, just, just, just go and build it, just put it out there. You know, we've got, and I actually think things like, um, well, there was that video that came out not long ago that we were watching out, out in, the, uh, in the hall a little bit earlier. Um, that sort of cool uh, visualization thing that showed uh, all of the contribution of code to Rails from when it first started all the way until recently when it, uh, when it was added to, uh, you know, converted from Subversion to Git, and then all of these new forks and, and codes and contributions came in and came to play. It's a cool video. And I, I think what it shows is the immediacy of, you know, as we come out with these new tools, like Git, like Twitter, like all of these different social networks that make it easier to communicate, easier to share, that's good. I mean, that's what we want. But it also changes the concept of the immediacy with which we come to expect things. We are becoming more and more impatient every day because these things that happen m make us think that it's, it's the only way to do something is for it to happen immediately. Um, I'm now telling you to stop. I'm now telling you to take a step back and to think. All of us have something that, that you know, one, one way to call it is a, a chattering mind, background chatter. Um, you know, even without the distractions that we talked about, even without Twitter and without I am and Campfire, our minds are still chattering. There's that little narrator or the little stream of consciousness in the back of your mind that's always going. A lot of the time we don't even realize that it's there. It's normal. Most, most if not everybody, has that. Uh, it, it's a normal thing. But it's hard enough to focus without all of these other distractions when your mind is so busy. Um, I want to talk for a minute about that, about that chattering mind. And one of the things that I think about a lot, when you talk about simplifying, simplifying your life, simplifying the things that you build, reducing chatter, um, I, I, I meditate every morning for about 45 minutes. Um, the uh, kind of meditation that I do, and I'll, um, I'll talk about it a little bit more, it's, it's, um, it's called mindfulness meditation. And uh, it, it involves bringing your awareness into the present moment, and you're trying to create a non-reactive, focused awareness that's absent of judgment or clinging. Now, this kind of meditation is called Vipassana. That's the Pali word for it. It's 2,600 years old. It was uh, something that uh, really first started, I, I think, uh, safe to say, back in, um, in India at the time of the Buddha. And uh, that kind of meditation has nothing to do with Buddhism. It has nothing to do with any religion. Uh, no religion owns uh, your mind and owns the ability to, to focus. And it's something that's really interesting because as you develop this, as you sit in meditation and focus on uh, a simple object like your breathing, you start to develop uh, an awareness of how your mind works. And if you do it long enough, if you do it regularly enough, you start to actually see that chatter that's going on in your mind. You get to see that from, from a different perspective. And it eventually starts to quiet down. And you don't have to be some monk up in a, you know, in a, in a mountain, in a cave somewhere, to be able to get benefits from this kind of meditation. Um, it's used in the treatment uh, of depression. They use it for substance abuse. They use it for people who have chronic pain. Uh, they use it for people who have, um, you know, tons of, you know, anxiety disorders, anything like that. Th this is the kind of thing that if you, if, if you had chronic back pain, they might have a, a chronic pain clinic that you'd go to that would teach you this kind of meditation. A lot of the time when I hear people talking about meditation, they think that it, it involves going and thinking about something. Or they think that it, it, it means going and clearing your mind of something. It, it, this type of meditation is neither of those things. It just simply means picking an object like you're breathing and focusing on it for a period of time. And over time, as you do that, you begin to get calm. So 
Um, my question, and I had, uh, I had thought about doing maybe a quick one or two minutes of, of this here today, and I'm not sure, you know, some people have been like, yeah, let's do it, I would love to try it. Other people are like, no, I don't think that has any place in a technology conference. So um, what I thought was that maybe we could try 30 seconds of this. And for those of you who aren't interested, check your email, you'll be demonstrating my point. Um, <laughs> the rest of you can, can try this, uh, and, and it's a simple exercise, and what I'd like for you to do for about 30 seconds, I'll time it, close your eyes, and without consciously trying to control or regulate your breathing, just pay attention to your breath. Are you breathing fast or slow, shallow or deep? What does it feel like? And try, if you can, to stay with your breathing. As you breathe in and out, just think to yourself, breathing in, breathing out. Okay, how many people thought that felt like an eternity? How many uh, people were uh, pitching in the World Series in their minds? <laughs> it's, it's interesting to think about um, how quickly your mind goes somewhere else. Oh, I wonder if he's gonna tell us it's been 30 seconds yet. Or, <laughs> you know, he said not to check my email, but I really want to. <laughs> It's, it's amazing how your mind jumps so quickly to that next thing. How hard it is to try to stay in a, in a mindful state. Imagine how much of a challenge it is for you to focus and be productive when you're with this sort of constant barrage of all these other cool communication things that, that we all like. Why do we like them? You know, well, we're being social. We're talking to our friends. We've got a community. I know a guy in you know, Europe, who's writing really cool code, we got something to talk about. I'm not saying any of those things are bad, I think they're great. I think the human race is evolving in a way through that kind of communication. I mean, you saw a big change when, you know, when trains were, uh, were built. You could get across an entire country in, in a period of weeks. That was unheard of. When, when big boats were built and you could cross the ocean. You know, this is just a step in our evolution as, as, uh, as a species. As a species, we're, we're communicating in a completely new way. Um, but it's, it's challenging enough to try to mitigate all of those different streams of information that are coming in when your mind itself is constantly chattering. One of the things that when you, when you get into meditation and you do it, the, the advice that they, that they give you is you eventually learn that that kind of thinking is just thinking. Oh, those are just thoughts. You no longer have this kind of association that those thoughts are, are me. Uh, the background noise is there, not just in your mind, but is in the things that you build too. There's a lot of extra stuff that we don't even know that we're putting into the, the, the stuff that we write, those extra features, the chatter that we're bringing to the applications when we build them. I think a big part of it comes from asking the right questions. You know, especially, how, how many people here are, are independent, like somebody hires you to write code, not, not working full time for somebody, but like you're an independent person? Okay, um, it, it, I think it's even, it, it's even harder for the people who are working full time at companies because you've got this corporate infrastructure, you've got bosses, you've got people who say it needs to do this. When you're independent, a lot of the time, maybe you don't even know it, but I'm willing to bet that if a customer came to you and wanted to hire you, they're not hiring you because you type well or because they think that you have good code skills. They've hired you because they think you're gonna create a great product. Behind that, they've hired you because they think that you know what you're doing. They expect you to tell them how it should be. And most of the time, as developers, especially in that role, and I was there for years, they're like, well, they, they said they wanted it to work like this. 
They said, that's what they said. So I'm just, I'm just gonna do it that way. I don't wanna make them angry, I gotta pay the mortgage. But in reality, they want you to tell them no. They want you, if you do it right. Uh, they, but the, the best way to do that is by asking the right kind of questions. If you know in the back of your head that something needs to really be built a certain way and they're opposing it, that's because they have assumptions. Well, you have assumptions too when you come and start trying to work on a problem. You're bringing that baggage, that chatter, that background noise. You're bringing that in. Say no and, and turn that around and forget your assumptions. Why are you building something? What assumptions have I already made? Do I believe that those assumptions are true? Do you believe your own thoughts? This is uh, Abraham Wald. He was a mathematician, he was born in Hungary, and he came to the United States when the Nazis invaded Austria, and he became a statistician working for the government in World War II. Um, one of the things, the projects that he worked on, and I should give credit to uh, Garrett Diamond and, and Cameron Mall, who've talked about this very thing before. Um, one of the, the projects that he worked on, the US government, during World War II, had these planes, and they would fly the planes out on missions, and the planes would get attacked by the enemies, and, and they were very interested to say, well, how can we strengthen our planes? How can we make them more resilient to attack? How can we increase their survival rate? So, uh, our friend uh, Abraham said, well, he theorized that the bullet hits are gonna be uniformly distributed across the entire aircraft. In other words, any one area of the aircraft is just as likely to be hit as any other. Now, he was correct about that when they actually plotted out where all the bullets were. Well, what the government was doing is they were coming back and, and you know, these planes would come out to battle and then some of them wouldn't make it, and some of them would. And the ones that made it back usually were riddled with bullet holes. And so these are the points on the planes that came back, these are where the, the, the bullet holes penetrated the plane. This is where they got hit. The government said, perfect. That's where we're gonna reinforce the planes. That is where we need to armor these planes. <laughs> well, no, those are the planes that came back. <laughs> the ones that didn't come back, they were hitting the other places. <laughs> but if you think about it, you think, well, this is, this is where the planes are being hit, therefore this is where we need to armor them. But that's not true, that's not the right kind of logic. I don't want to be mean to our customers, but that's customer logic. That's not developer logic right there. Um, it's, it's uh, my, my friend Garrett, uh, he said, if, if you ask the wrong question, then the answer is irrelevant. A lot of the time we need to, to, to teach our clients or our bosses what the right questions are. But that's not easy. And it's especially not easy for, for us, for you guys. Why? Because you, you know too much already. Once you have knowledge, it's incredibly difficult for us to remember what it's like to not have that knowledge. Think about that. The things that you know, all of us in this room, I can say GitHub, you all know what it means. I can talk about a commit, you all know what it means. I can talk about anything to do with Ruby and Rails. You guys probably know it even better than I do. We have this shared body of knowledge. But how do you explain Ruby on Rails to your mom? How do you explain what you do for a living to your grandparents or to somebody who has never used a computer? Because the things that we build are not really real the way that a can opener is real. You can't hold it in your hand, what we, what we do. It's all in our, it's in our minds and it's in the minds of people that, that are using the software that we build. And this, this concept of you knowing too much, a lot of All right, can you hear me? Okay, this is awesome. That's good because we're close, we're almost done. Um, this is why some developers, I'm sure none, none of you, but some developers sometimes come across as being arrogant because we know too much. We know more than our customers know. And you know what we do, technically speaking, generally we do. We know too much. 
it's hard for us it's hard for us to remember what it was like to be in their shoes to not know what we know and it's hard to find that reference point um, you know we we live in private silos a lot of the time this community we all know, we all have the shared body of information. The more you talk with other developers, the more you talk with people in this community, the more you start to think that you're normal. The more you start to think that everybody thinks like this. <laughs> and it's, it, we don't, most people don't think like us. I mean, we, we have a unique kind of window into a world that I think is very creative. Most people don't get. We have to sort of, get out of these silos. I mean, there used to be this expression that people would use where they would say, oh, well, you know, be, be your own user. Figure out, you know, what, you know what, use yourself as if you were the user. But we're terrible at that. If we were left to design all of that stuff and come up with all that stuff, nine times out of 10, we'd build something for ourselves. but we're not the end user. Most of our users spend their time using other websites, not the ones that we build. They spend their time using other applications, not the ones we come up with. We're bad cases when it comes to figuring out what works and what doesn't. A lot of the time, I, I sometimes, you know, whether they're friends or other people will come to me and say, Dan, help, help me figure out how to make my application better. Why aren't we getting the kind of customer signups or retention that we want? You know, and when you think about that, you say, well, who did you design this app for? Who designed this app? Who built it? I don't want to get into the whole conversation of focus groups because they're pretty bad too. The answer is there, there is no definitive answer, but it's the approach that really counts. If you're trying to forget what you think you know, if you're trying to create space, you, you're going to be successful. What do I mean when I say that? I don't just mean physical space I, or screen space. I mean, try to create a spaciousness around what you do. Try to, you know, everybody has deadlines, but try to move more slowly. Try not to let that constant chatter that we are always experiencing affect the kind of code that we write and the kind of products that we reduce. And I know this kind of sounds like, you know, this, this big lofty picture of a perfect world up in the sky. But these are the kinds of things you can really apply when you're trying to solve a problem. And not just in your code, but in the implementation. Those things, you know, the, the websites that have big, giant, colorful, everything's Ajaxified. I mean, why do you need, do you need, does every single thing need to, you know, poof out and be draggable? You know, sometimes, yeah, that's a perfectly good solution to a problem. But don't go into it thinking which part of the screen are they going to want to drag. Just build the website, build the form. Let the, let the functionality determine the implementation for a change. This is kind of the final message I want to I I leave you with. Because before, I used to, years ago, I used to say the opposite. And this whole conference has been about doing more and being more productive. And I think you can be more productive by doing less. Maybe that sounds backwards. But if you have an idea, you want to reduce that idea. You want to simplify it. You want to distill it. You want to try and say, what am I really getting at here? How would I explain this to my mom or my grandmother or that person who's never used a computer? If it's hard to do that, then it means you, you, might need to, you might benefit from simplifying things a little bit more. Reduce the concept, reduce it down. Once you have an idea, simplify it and reduce it even more. You know, if you're building an application or you're launching a service, make a list of the things that you absolutely must do to be successful and then throw half of them away just to get started. Um, you know, so many times people are trying to build everything into one application. It becomes this do-all solution. And uh, I was talking earlier to the, to the New Relic guys, we were talking about how um, 37 Signals says they get to a point with their application where they, they realize that the application is, is doing enough. When is your application doing enough? When is it time to say, this, this now needs to be a whole new application? This needs to be something else. We can't keep augmenting it. It's almost that iPhone application mentality. These iPhone apps are, are known for doing one thing. I have a, an app on my iPhone that's a little level that you can use to like 
you know it it, it doesn't it's not also a, you know a flashlight it just it's just the level you know that's great about iPhone apps because they only cost 99 cents and you can just download them and put them on your phone and try them using when you need them we've almost gone the other way we've almost said well we want it, er, apps that do everything you know we've we've lost track of our ideas so besides doing less um, relax people think of meditation as a way to relax and chill out and solve problems it really isn't um, when you're meditating and scientists have shown this they hooked up um, little uh, electrodes to to you know like Tibetan monks and stuff when they were they were doing their meditation and they found by studying them and also by by looking at their brains and, and studying the way that their brains worked and what was actually going on when they were meditating they found to their surprise that they did not look like the brains of people who were sleeping or, or relaxing or, or anything like that at all what they found were that their brains looked exactly the same as the brains of people who were f who were very very focused on something very much like the way an athlete uh, or somebody who's shooting a bow and arrow or doing target practice uh, paying attention somebody who is working very hard at solving a problem those same brain patterns would light up in the mind of a meditator well, when I read that I laughed well, of course because I know that that 45 minutes every morning when I'm sitting there, my, I, I'm, I'm focusing harder than I'll probably focus on the rest of the day. And yeah, I'll feel more calm and peaceful, but I wouldn't necessarily think that relaxation is the goal. The goal is to kind of get that clarity and that peace. The byproduct is that you feel more relaxed. And I think if we have a relaxed approach to the things that we build, if we relax and we stop trying to do so much, quiet that chatter down, maybe we can build something that lasts. That's it.